TNT. Well, welcome back to the Johnny Vadmore Show on today's News Talk TNT. And I can confirm that as a host here on TNT, I have never, ever been censored, been told what to speak about or been told what not to speak about, more importantly. And this is why I'm able to bring on guests like my first guest up today, who's really interesting fella. And, and you know, on, on a lot of platforms, you're not allowed to talk about these things in this way. And I'm really, really happy that I've had the opportunity at TNT to have these conversations. This is massively important. So my first guest up is a return turning guest, as someone who I I said I really want to speak to more. Dr. Marcus Papadopoulos is a leading British historian, analyst, and author specializing in Russia and the former Soviet Union. He earned his Bachelor of Arts degree in Law and Modern History at London Guildhall University, received a Master Honours, uh, a Master Degree in um, uh, modern History at Royal Holloway, University of London, and also at Royal... Uh, uh, and he was also awarded a PhD in Russian History. You can find him on X at Dr. Marcus P, and I suggest you do. Welcome to the Johnny Vedmore Show again, Dr. Pap uh, Papadopoulos. How are you today? Thank you ever so much, Johnny, for having me back on your show, and I'm very much looking forward to this discussion yeah you're an interesting fella and i think it's uh voices like yours which are missing out of the mainstream that would really have helped us over the past few years as well because of course you live in the real world you live in reality so um let's start off compared to the days of soviet russia has the west lurched politically left and the east lurched politically right and are we at risk of seeing a total reversal in the paradigm of the past well the war which is raging in the western world a savage war being waged by the western ruling elites against the nations whom they rule, not govern, whom they rule, is not a war between left and right, or capitalism and socialism stroke communism, no. It is a war between good and evil, freedom and tyranny, culture and depravity, and God and Satan. The claim that the Western world has become communist is really stupidity at its most stupid. Let us just consider who constitutes the heart of the Western ruling elites, the British royal family, the British aristocracy, the banking elites, the financial elites, the military chiefs, the intelligence chiefs, the media barons, and Zionists. Are we really going to accept that the aforementioned groups are now communist? The claim that what we see happening, for example, in Britain or in America, is a result of communism, has been put out by the Western ruling elites to distract the ordinary person from realizing who is actually waging this war. So for example, the so-called conservative wing of Western mainstream media is alleging that the Biden family is communist, the Obama family is communist, and the Clinton family is communist. Now, anyone who knows even the basics of communism will reject that immediately because in the Western world, the, uh, for example, the economy of America, the economy of Britain is owned by the Western ruling elites, be it the British royal family, be it British aristocracy, be it banking elites. If you have a look in the Soviet Union, who owned the natural resources? 
Who owned the economy? Well, it wasn't individuals. For example, Stalin. No, it was owned by the Soviet state. Was there corruption in the Soviet Union? Of course there was corruption, but no individual owned any aspect of the Soviet economy, of Soviet industry, of Soviet natural resources. Indeed, um, Stalin didn't have a penny to his name. So that is why I say that this argument, if we can even call it an argument, that the Western world is communist, is simply the result of propaganda being put out by the Western ruling elites to distract people and to ensure that the ordinary man and woman do not identify who is actually behind all of this. If someone is going to say that Britain and America is communist because both countries are now tyrannies, which they are, then I would say to that person, how do you explain Henry VIII's England? Because that was a tyranny. How do you explain Oliver Cromwell's England? Uh, because that was a tyranny. How do you explain Mussolini's Italy? Because that was a tyranny. And how would you explain Hitler's Germany? Because that is also a tyranny. A tyranny is not just um, a, a, a communist um, manifestation. It is also a manifestation of numerous other entities. So we must not fall into the trap of the Western ruling elite by thinking that the Western world is communist or the Western world is liberal. It is not communist. It is not liberal. It is not conservative. The Western world is a tyranny, is a kleptocracy, and its ideology is deranged. It is absolutely deviant, and there is not one human dimension to the ideology of the Western ruling elites. Let us be absolutely clear. The Western ruling elites hate the ordinary people in the Western world whom they whom they rule, and they are ex and they are demonstrating that in various means. So, for example, bringing immigrants from outside of the Western world into the Western world to destroy the Western world from within, and that is why we see the cultural and spiritual values of the uh, nations of the Western world being systematically destroyed. Where's the British national identity today? Who 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 has caused? the almost complete destruction of the British national identity. Communism? How? If it's communism, then that means the British royal family and the British aristocracy and the British banking elites are communists. Of course they are not communists. As again, this is Western, uh, Western mainstream media propaganda. Do not fall into this trap. Yes, and I tell you, if you could hear the standing ovation inside my mind, Marcus, I have to say, I agree with you. Um, and I find it really contrived uh, nowadays. Uh, there's a lot of, especially American right wing commentators who are very quick to use that term communist to paint anything that they don't agree with uh, as something that we will be definitely tarred by such a, uh, a statement. Now, I talk to. Um, Richard Poe on occasion, who I like very much. I think he's a, a very sweet individual. He's very lovely. Been on my podcast, been on the show a few times, and he believes that the British were heavily responsible in the creation of Marxism, historically speaking. Were the British controlling more than people today assume? And I, to add on to that as well, the the for what you've just said there, was Marxism just a tool for these uh, tyrannical leaders to hide behind while they acted in a completely different manner? Allow me, first of all, Johnny, to say this. The British ruling elite is the most criminal, the most violent, the most murderous, the most sadistic, the most duplicitous, the most deceitful and the most intelligent ruling elite in history. Now, 
specifically in response to your question, I am open to any argument, providing it is corroborated with concrete evidence. So if we are talking about events from history, I will entertain any argument, providing it is supported by primary source evidence. For example, uh, government files or personal diaries or personal papers from people at the time. I want documents. I don't want claims. I want documents. So in regard to the claim that the British ruling elite uh, covertly created Marxism, I'm willing to discuss that. But my first question will be, where's the primary source evidence? And I'm not just referring to British archives. I'm talking about primary source evidence in French archives or German archives or Russian archives. If someone is going to make that allegation, they have to support it with primary source evidence. So this is what I would say to that suggestion. And I'm not going to rule it out, but again, I want documents. But this is what I would say. It was not in the interests of the British ruling elite for, um, uh, for, Bolshe for the Bolsheviks to withdraw Russia from the First World War. Why? Because it meant that German forces, which had been fighting against the Russians in Eastern Europe, were now transferred to the Western Front to fight against the British and French armies there, meaning Kaiser Wilhelm had a free hand in the West. He didn't have to fight the Russians um, any longer. Secondly, it was not in the interests of the British ruling elite for the Bolsheviks to withdraw Russia from the global and financial uh, for, from the global banking and financial sectors, which incidentally Hitler would do in Germany some years later. And thirdly, it was not in the interests of the British ruling elite for the Bolsheviks to execute the Romanovs and much of the Russian aristocracy. I, I use the word Russian very loosely because, of course, much of the Russian aristocracy was not actually ethnic um, Russian. So that is why I say, how was it in the interests of the British to create Marxism? The, the British ruling elite have faced three um, very serious threats to their existence in history. The first one was from Napoleon Bonaparte. Uh, the second one was from Soviet communism, principally in the 1920s. And the third threat was from Nazi Germany. Now, I say uh, in regard to Soviet communism, principally in the 1920s. Certainly, it was a threat to Britain when Lenin was in charge, but he was only in charge for a few years. After he died, there was a collective leadership, and Stalin became leader, um, really, in 1927. So in those years, from the end of the Russian Civil War in 1922 up until 1927, yes, there was a threat to Britain from Soviet communism, and it was a very serious threat. But under Stalin, that threat seriously receded. Why? Because Stalin was not a revolutionary. He wanted to build socialism, communism at home, and above everything else, he wanted to ensure that Russia would never again be invaded. So that is why, after 1945, he ensured that the Red Army would not withdraw from Eastern Europe. Why? 
because the Russians achieved something after 1945 that they had never had before, namely a first line of defense. So how many times had Russia been invaded by armies from its Western frontiers? So from 1945 onwards, if a country in the West wants to invade Russia, it will have to go through um, the Soviet satellite states in Eastern Europe. And on top of that, again, why I say that Stalin was not a revolutionary, Stalin very much wanted the Grand Alliance, uh, which was formed during World War II after the Germans invaded uh, the Soviet Union. Stalin very much wanted the Grand Alliance to continue. What's my evidence for that? Firstly, um, Stalin um, withdrew the Red Army from Vienna. He stuck to his agreement with Churchill. He didn't have to do that, but he withdrew the Red Army from Vienna. On top of that, Stalin did not have to did not have to let the Western Allies into Berlin. After all, the Red Army conquered Berlin, and the campaign by the Red Army to conquer Berlin um, incurred three hundred thousand Soviet casualties, of which one hundred thousand were fatalities. So Stalin could have said, we conquered uh, Berlin, I'm not going to let you in. But he did allow the Americans, the British and the French armies into Berlin. He stuck to the agreement uh, with Churchill because Stalin wanted the Grand Alliance to continue. So um, in short, if someone is making the argument that the British invented Marxism, they're going to have to address the points I have raised. And most important of all, they're going to have to support their claim with primary source evidence. Yeah, right. I, I like everything you said there. I do believe that people tried to simplify extremely complicated events, tried to put a, an umbrella across the top of what they see as power. Um, I've written recently about the idea of a ballroom of power where all the powerful exist, all the power exists on many different tables run by many different people, interest groups. And it's not just a, a pyramid with a, a nice, easy, easy to recognize point at the top where we can look and say if we destroy this one monster we could change the world and i find that's what a lot of people are trying to do with this sort of rhetoric i'm, I'm skipping the news headlines today because i i really want to hear more from you uh but we're gonna have to take um, a break in about five minutes what i want to ask first i'm gonna ask you uh one question that leads on from what you were saying there and then i'm going to ask some questions from the chat so some people in the chat have asked some questions that i think are, are very useful and again thank you uh marcus for coming on the show i really do appreciate this um what can the west learn from napoleon and hitler's expeditions into russia well uh the short answer is that when russia has been invaded, the Russian people will sacrifice millions of their people to ensure that Russia prevails, regardless of the cost. Why is it that the Russian people are fervently behind the Russian military campaign in Ukraine? Because they believe that Russia is threatened by NATO in Ukraine. So the Russian people are not like the American people. They're not like the British people. They're not like the French people. They are prepared to see millions of fellow Russians die if it means that Russia prevails, that Russia survives, that the Russian people live. Now, these politicians and journalists in Britain and America today are completely ignorant about history. They don't really understand the dangers of threatening Russia, it's like Napoleon threatened Russia, like Hitler threatened Russia. So 
we see today useful idiots who have columns on the in the Guardian newspaper or in, in the Telegraph newspaper saying that the Russian military is a third-rate power and the Russian um, nuclear arsenal is not to be taken seriously. I don't know, Johnny, if these people really believe what they are saying. I know they are useful idiots and I know they are paid to say what they write. Whether they truly believe it or not, I don't know. But it is dangerous. What I would say about the German invasion of the Soviet Union is this. The Germans, on a number of occasions, came very, very close to winning the war in Russia. In December of 1941, the German army, the Wehrmacht, was some 12 kilometers away from the Kremlin. During the battle for Stalingrad, which started in September of 1942, um, the Germans were just a few meters away from victory in Stalingrad, um, from victory on the, on the river Volga. So that is something the Russian people are very aware of. It's not something they like to talk about because it is extremely painful for them. It terrifies them. Why did the Red Army win? Well, there are, there are a number of reasons um, for that. And some of the reasons are on account of extraordinary fighting abilities of the Russian soldier, of the ordinary Russian, extraordinary levels of endurance and endeavor of the ordinary Red Army infantryman and the ordinary Russian, this ferocious patriotism um, of the ordinary Russian. But at the same time, um, serious mistakes were made by the Germans. And I'm not actually talking about Hitler. I'm talking about the German high command. A lot of Hitler's orders were not being implemented by the German high command. And I, I won't go into detail, but there was serious tension between the Nazi leadership and the German high command. So all was not well on the German side. So, yes, the Red Army won in the end, as we know. It was a bittersweet victory because some 30 million people, uh, Soviet people um, perished um, in that war. But, again, the Germans came very, very close. Um, all kudos to the Russian people, to the Soviet people, because they, in the end, halted and eventually destroyed the most formidable fighting machine in history, namely the Wehrmacht. Yes, yeah, I agree with you uh, there too. I mean, it is a extraordinary events. Anybody who who goes and looks at the history of that uh, just should be horrified and should understand how important Russia were, has has been to stop uh, uh, stopping the tyranny that Hitler uh, posed or the tyrannical rule which Hitler posed. We're going to take a quick short break and then I'm going to come back with some questions from the chat, Marcus. You're listening to today's news. Talk TNT. <laughs> 